with a Fox News alert. The Republicans' latest attempt to get rid of Obamacare appears to be all but dead. On life support, you might say. After another key defection in the Senate. And the White House reportedly ready to blame Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell for not getting the job done as the president takes a shot at those he calls so-called Republicans. It is heating up. Pleasure with the members of his own party. A short time ago at the White House, he said this. We were very disappointed by a couple of senators, Republican senators, I must, I must say. We were very disappointed uh, that uh, they would take the attitude that they did. At some point, there will be a repeal and replace. Uh, but uh, we'll see whether or not that point is now or will it be shortly thereafter. But we are disappointed in certain so-called Republicans. Whew, I feel like Republicans who are going against this just moved from the oven with the muffins to the microwave. It's, it's total insanity. It's quick and hot. I mean, we need to have the Senate and, and, the, and Congress work together for the American people. The American people always last. And it's just, I hate to see that. And that's why I'm running for Congress in my district, because they need to have somebody who goes to Congress and actually works for them. And uh, this is really tough to see. You know, it's uh, to see these senators kind of have their ego. And they have to have their ego checked at some point. You know, this is crazy. That's what you think this is about. This is about ego, yeah. It's about power and it's about, you know, I got to do this. And if I don't do this, I don't want to give the credit to our president. And it's not about the president or the wow. party. It's about the American people. But what do you make of the blame game that's going on right now with the president pointing all fi fingers at Mitch McConnell and saying, you know what, if nothing gets done, it's not my fault? Well, he, you know, they're, they're, they're pointing the fingers at him every single day. He's trying the best he can. I mean, it's not, like I said, it's not about the president, it's about the American people. Can we do something together and work together for once? and help the American people that need the help. Mm. Lisa? Well, I think Americans don't care where the finger is pointing. They just want to see something get done. And I think that's the frustration when you have Republicans promising something for seven plus years and then fail to do it, particularly when you see people uh, like Senator John McCain, who has said that he wants repeal, who voted for efforts in 2015, which were much more robust. Uh, and then as a no vote here, you look at someone like Senator Rand Paul, who was for the skinny repeal, uh, which seemed to be less of what this is, but now is against the, the latest version with Graham Cassidy. So I think it is very frustrating for Americans who are wondering, you know, where are these members on this? It seems to be uh, very confusing for them. And I also want to know if uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, what's he going to do about this? Is he going to pull people from their chairmanship? Is he going to take them off key committees? What's the recourse here? Because we are going to come up against this again with tax reform because the same ideological divides uh, that have basically prevented But on that note, should they just ditch the Obamacare repeal and move on to tax reform in hopes of having more success well, there? They're going to have to because now they're up against this deadline, which is Saturday, but more Thursday due, due to Yom Kippur. So they're going to have to move forward with tax reform, but it is going to make it difficult because they're hoping to get repeal done to have some more money for tax mm. reform. Now they're not going to have that. So with the finger pointing, I would imagine, though, Jillian, the American people wouldn't mind it pointing at them if it meant that, hey, you count. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good point. If you look at it that way, that makes sense. But I just, to piggyback off what Lisa said, I think, th so seven years in, I would ask Republican leadership if they were here today, why does it still feel like this is trying to get through, they're trying to get this through like on a wing and a prayer, something that affects one-fifth to one-sixth about... of the national economy, depending on how you count things, right? Yeah. So what Why about bipartisanship? I, I want to watch this from Senator Chuck Schumer and then get your thoughts on this. Watch this. Senator Collins and to the rest of my Republican colleagues, I want to say this. Once repeal is off the table, we want to work with you to improve the existing system. Once this bill goes down, we're ready to work with you to find a compromise that stabilizes markets, that lowers premiums. We're ready. All right, so is it time to call the Democrats bluff? Maybe, except look how favorably Americans look at the deal that Chuck and Nancy have been able to strike with the president so Why far. Why do you think that is? By and large, I think the American people love that because like Lisa said, what people want to see today is the Congress different sides of the aisle working together and producing something so, rather than just stymieing everything. So does the president now again reach across the aisle and get this done on his own? He's going to have to at some point. I mean, we need to, I mean, like I say, if you're stranded on the desert and you had a piece of bread, would you just wait for the whole loaf or would you just eat that little piece? I think we need to work with what we have. We can't get the whole deal down today, but we'll get it tomorrow. We need to start somewhere at some point. Obamacare is a failure. It's failed from day one and is going to continue. 
you. And California is even worse. I mean, it's extremely deadly. So. Uh, I, tax reform, though. I mean, you think this would be a shoe in for this administration, Republicans, everybody's on board to do something there, right? So we hope. Why not yeah. move forward with that and get a W on the board? As you keep hearing, this president, this administration, they need a win. Why not just move on? I agree. Uh, well, at some point, we're going to have to move on and get some sort of deal on the, on, on, on the table. And we hope this is going to get done in the next few weeks. Well, I don't know. You know, Lisa, when you look at kind of how campaigns are run and now we're into a presidency, you do always have like that honeymoon period, that like glory time, right? <laughs> when you can kind of get stuff done, make some mistakes, whatever. Are we still in that or are we edging our way out of that for this president in terms of getting that checked box for health care for that first win, as Sandra's putting it? Well, I think we're out of that because we're up against a lot of hard deadlines. There's going to be a lot of things that Congress are looking to get done, whether it's tax reform, whether it's um, DACA, or even, again, having to vote on the debt ceiling as well. So, I mean, Congress is going to be dealing with a lot of issues that deeply divide Congress, whether it's among the Republican Party or Democrats. And, you know, I wish I was optimistic on getting something done on a bipartisan effort with Obamacare. I just don't think it's going to happen because this was such a key legacy win. So you don't win. believe Chuck Schumer when he says, no, if you I take don't. repeal off the table, we'll do a deal. You don't trust No, that. I mean, it's easy to say you're for bipartisanship, but where, where's the effort? What have you done? Uh, minority where's the leader, track record? Chuck Schumer. Yeah, where's the track <laughs> record? It's like, I can say whatever I want, but if you're not actually putting forth the effort, then it's just lip service. And that's exactly what that is. And I just think Obamacare is such a key issue so what for the, the Democrat Party. It, it like, ain't happening. I was, gonna, I was just so sure Lisa was going to say, Harris, this president never had a honeymoon period. What are you talking about? That's, oh, and then you said it. But you did it. <laughs> but she didn't. But, but she did it. Okay, but it's but over. Did, it's, so. definitely, <laughs> it's definitely over. Over. And, and do you think it's <laughs> over for the same reasons? Because those deadlines that are looming now, as Republicans voted, um, well, actually, they didn't, did they? Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer voted with the president to, to kind of kick it down, the debt ceiling down, the, the kick the can down the road again. Well, and that's an easy deal, too, because you're simply just talking about raising the debt ceiling, and then you're also talking about funding uh, for Harvey victims of that hurricane. You would think uh, that it would be, but it, apparently the president yeah. felt like he needed to reach across the aisle to get it done. Well, the, the concerns were Republicans. Republicans wanted a longer uh, amount of time given there because, as I mentioned, there's a lot of hard deadlines they're yeah. coming up against, and so they feel like it gave the Democratic Party some leverage. Uh, but regardless of that, that's a much easier thing to come to an agreement upon rather than something like tax reform or Obamacare. You bring up leverage, that's, and that yeah. is such an important word as we move into almost October now. Mm -hmm. You, the, the Republicans lose that leverage w with tax reform more specifically. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden we're talking about that not getting done by end of year and move into an election year, right. Republicans, don't they lose a lot of leverage when it comes to that? I think both parties are losing a lot right now, but uh, I hope they won't. I know I, I, that's why I'm running for Congress because I'm sick of this as much as everybody else. We sit back and we watch these people talk and fight and argue every single day for years and nothing gets done. We had a chance to do something with Obamacare and they would they you work it. with the Democrats to get it done? I would work with anyone if to get it done. Hill? Absolutely. I have to. I have to do it. I owe it to the American people. I owe it to the veterans. I owe it to the community that I live in. I mean, it's really important, the future of this country. And uh, like I said, you know, we had a chance to do it, and we know who, who did it, and uh, they blew it. Uh, next time around, hopefully, we'll get it done. I think All that's right. the only responsible answer in this day and age, too, you know, that you're yeah. willing to work across the aisle. You have okay. to. Yeah. Uh, President Trump's showdown with the NFL is continuing <laughs> after the Dallas Cowboy players and the team's owner dropped to their knees before last night's game and before the national anthem, actually, I should say. Now veterans groups are slamming the protests altogether. Is it time for the NFL leaders to step in? Well, some of them are. He's on his knee there. And Hillary Clinton now calling her email scandal overblown and accusing the Trump White House of hypocrisy over reports some officials used private email accounts to talk about governmental matters. But is it fair for her to be making these comparisons? We'll talk about it. Antonio. President Trump not backing down in his battle with the NFL and now drawing attention to fans pushing back against national anthem protests. The president tweeting this morning, quote, the booing at the NFL football game last night when the entire Dallas team dropped to its knees was loudest I have ever heard. Great anger. He was referring to this moment when the Cowboys with team owner Jerry Jones took a knee before the game. But the president 
praised the team for standing when the actual na national anthem began to play. Tweeting, quote, but while Dallas dropped to its knees as a team, they all stood up for our national anthem. Big progress being made. We all love our country. Meantime, Seattle Seahawks wide receiver Doug Baldwin defended his team staying in the locker room on Sunday while blasting President Trump. What I feel deep down in my heart and what a lot of people across this great nation feel deep down in their heart is that there's been a perpetual cycle of hate uh, being spewed from the greatest position that our country has to offer uh, from the White House. But now some veterans groups are slamming the protesting athletes, including the head of the American Legion, who calls their actions, quote, misguided and ungrateful and says... There are many ways to protest, but the national anthem should be our moment to stand together as one United States of America. First, Antonio, your thoughts. I agree 100 percent. Listen, uh, you have the right to protest. Uh, I have no problem with that, but not on the field, not in front of people, not in front of the American people and not in front of veterans that are risking and have died for our freedom. So that's not the place to do so. You want to protest? Go to Chicago. Get together with the entire team, get together your money, 20 some million dollars a year, and go help the inner cities in Chicago. When was the last time a team actually went out there and, and actually protested? What are you pro I, don't, I don't think a lot of these folks, a lot of these players, know what they're protesting about. They just want to protest, and that's the wrong place to do so. Well, we are seeing a president that is not letting up on his criticism of these players, uh, but he did, he did praise them a bit for actually standing when the national anthem began. During the national anthem, because that is something, as Lisa pointed out yesterday, <laughs> that should unite all of us. Um, but I, I want to press on a little bit, because I took some heat when I said exactly what you just said yesterday. Mm -hmm. So our brain room looked, 216 deaths, homicides, just between June 21st and September 20th, just one summer right, season right. in that one particular urban area of Chicago. Exactly. Okay, uh, 510 since the beginning of the year. I mean, if we had any other group of people dying in those numbers, any other thing mm -hmm. going away in those numbers, it would be catastrophic. I, and I don't understand why to those fair, black lives don't matter. So to please, be fair him. though, Roger Goodell has, and if, if, if you follow him on any of his social media accounts, he daily posts his players going out into their communities mm -hmm. and volunteering their time and their fame, meeting with young children in some of these struggling communities. So they're not doing nothing. But this is a and perfect you, time to do so. They should do it right now. Like the coach of the Penguins, I believe, just happened the other day. He said, if you're not going out there, you're not saluting the flag, you're not playing today. And it should be like that because you have the freedom to be in the greatest country in the world and saluting the greatest flag in the world and you kneel, well, that's not the we, right time. And can we talk about Roger Goodell for a moment? Because he said that he is proud of his league for what they're doing right now. Was he proud of his league when he wouldn't let the Dallas Cowboys memorialize those Dallas police officers who were assassinated on their helmets? Was he proud of his league when Avery Williamson, he wouldn't allow to commemorate 9 11, the 15th anniversary of 9-11 on his cleats? And I'll read you something. Mark Thiessen has a great Great column in the Washington Post. I encourage people to read it. But what he remarks is a Gold Star mother was asked about this, and her quote was saying, My heart kind of stopped and I lost my breath because the flag that I see is a flag that I draped on my son's casket. And she was asked this last year on CNN about Colin Kaepernick. So I think that is something to think about of how it affects people like her. Yeah, and it's such an interesting point, too, because what we're talking about, either it's on the streets of Chicago or wherever you would want to protest, it's mm -hmm. different than inside of a venue where people have paid a lot of money to sit there and escape and have fun. But those people also have the right to leave the stadium. They'll argue right back, right? Well, there's an argument that's been going around about, and people disagree about this, about whether the First Amendment protects you in the workplace or not, to, meaning if you get fired from any job because you've said something, that the boss deems is inappropriate. Do you think it's a First Amendment issue? Because nobody's arguing about the fact that, they, at least I haven't heard, that it, they have the right to do this. It's not about what a lot of people is are. I think a lot of people allowed. But I think we're also talking about mores and morals too, right? Yeah, yeah this is about. You know, do you want to criticize you him for the right, that. or do you want to criticize his decision? But, but I also, would say that just as a protest movement, 
I think it's not having the desired or intended effect of the originator. So Colin Kaepernick from the beginning was saying he was doing this because he wanted to spark dialogue about race relations in you this think country. He's still doing it for to that cast reason? a spotlight on that. I don't know what his own. Well, he's not employed right but now. But the he's point is that we're not talking about confused. race relations. We're talking about right. this is. Well, let's this go is back to the president's words about patriotism. Uh, uh, let me bring in, in, in Jim Acosta. Okay, mm -hmm. you hear from him a lot in the White House, a, mm -hmm. a, a reporter who's been very vocally uh, challenging of this president. Uh, he tweeted on the culture war that appears to be, saying this, Trump advisor tells me POTUS is winning the culture war, just made millionaire sport athletes his new HRC, Hillary Rodham Clinton. But I, I think Americans get confused, though, when uh, players get fined for dancing in the end zone, or as what Mark Thiessen writes. What about Tim Tebow? But here's important as well. The game, NFL's criticism. game operations manual oh. says that players must be on the sideline for the national anthem. They must stand at attention, face the flag, hold their helmets in their left hand, and refrain from talking, or they face things like fines, suspensions. Apparently so I think that's where enforced. I think that's where Americans get confused. Uh, is because there does seem to be this double standard. And as I pointed out earlier, there also seems to be a double standard with what is protected under the First Amendment, according to the NFL, but, and what isn't. In the NFL, if you take a knee, look at Tim Tebow when he would pray. Right. And the criticism that they he would get. got criticized for doing right? so. Right? I mean, which way Shameful. is it? Are you allowed to right. kneel in yeah. protest but not in prayer? I'm confused. And how Spell can it you? out to me like I'm saying. There's no Americans. boundaries. And what they're is, allowed to do you know, whatever, whatever they want to do on a daily basis. Uh, there's no really any uh, aftermath. I mean, they, they keep doing this. I mean, but listen, the NFL is going to lose. Because this weekend, you watch the ratings. They'll go down and it'll just keep Curious going down. To see. Yeah. Well, but Goodell has already Hollywood said this is, is protected speech. According to him, this is okay. This is kosher and this is, they're going to continue to do this. So he's already put a, you know, his stamp But what is on next? The Burning the flag maybe on the field? What is next? I mean, if we start with doing this, then what is next? It's a fair we need point. To, we need to stop this before it gets too bad. And we are allowing people to make a lot of money to express how they feel anytime they want. And there's kids out there. There's families watching football games. They want to relax. They want to forget about the problems in the world. They don't want to hear about uh, protesting on the field. That's just the wrong, and wrong place. And you have the right to sit here and make that very point, Antonio. Exactly. That's right. I right. man for that. <laughs> President Trump going all out for his candidate in today's Senate primary runoff in Alabama, where whether the president's political clout takes a hit if his guy loses. Plus, Hillary Clinton calling out the president's son-in-law and advisor Jared Kushner over reports he's used his private email for White House business. Whether she's the one to be taking this line of attack and why Hillary still appears to be in denial about her own email use. Are you watching this? All eyes on a race in Alabama that many people see as a big test of President Trump's political clout right now. Today's GOP Senate primary runoff pits incumbent Luther Strange, the establishment candidate backed by the president, against former Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore. He has the backing of more populist insurgent GOP figures like the president's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. President Trump made a final push for Senator Strange just today. He tweeted this. Luther Strange has been shooting up in the Alabama polls since my endorsement to finish the job. Vote for Big Luther. But however today shakes out, the president says he'll stump for more should he win. He promised as much as a rally for Strange last week. If Luther doesn't win, they're not going to say we picked up 25 points in a very short period of time. They're going to say, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, was unable to pull his candidate across the line. It is a terrible, terrible moment for Trump. This is total embarrassment. I mean, these are bad people. And I told Luther, I have to say this, if his opponent wins, I'm going to be here campaigning like hell for him. So you know what that's reminiscent of? That's how the Democrats roll. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I mean, we were there when Bernie Sanders had to, to put a straight line emoji face and, <laughs> and be part of the nomination pre process of yeah. Hillary Clinton. But then they galvanize, they get on board together. Well, I want the president and everybody in the Republican Party to support me at VoteAntonia.com because I'm going to win this seat and we need it. So uh, I think Senator Strange has a good shot. I mean, we'll about to, we're about to see it tonight. But what I'm surprised about is how much money they raise for these campaigns. I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. So hopefully the right person will win and uh, once again fight for the American people. That's, that's the most important thing for me. Lisa? Oh, I like the plug. That was smart. You got to. <laughs>
Where, it wasn't know, even I, delicate. Yeah, it was like, you know, <laughs> the, hey, the I party I'm fighting you know, against yeah. is a tough party to win against. So I mean, we're gonna we're gonna win, but we need the, the American people to support me at uh, in my vote in Tony. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you got him to say it twice. <laughs> But there is a, there's a so much hype about this race, and I just think that it's it's sort of ridiculous because it's basically you don't Trump. think the Alabama runoff is important? No, no, I don't. I really honestly don't because it's basically Trump versus Trump land. I've seen that headline in the news, and I think it really sort of um, embolizes. You know, right. it, it it really you know summarizes the race is the word I was trying to find. Um, where, you know, it's basically Trump and his endorsed candidate versus, like, all the people that backed him. And ultimately, whoever wins this uh, runoff is going to go on to win the uh, special election in December. There's just no way. It would be a fool's errand for the Democrat Party to invest resources in Alabama when they have so many tough races, incumbents, that they're going to be trying to protect coming up here in the November uh, 2018 election. So it just, it's not going to happen. You can go back and look whether it's President Trump winning the state, Senator Shelby or Senator Jeff Sessions, all of them have beat their Democrat opponents over 60 percent in the state. It's just it's and much ado about nothing, nothing in my to opinion. Particularly politically flip that state. Uh, you know, but in a bigger picture, how much are we seeing on display that the president's political mojo? Well, the reason people are saying this is a win-win, right, is because at the end of the day, no matter who wins, it, you're still going to see uh, the average American public that is still upset with what is happening in Washington, D.C., what is mm -hmm. the distrust of our government, and you still got that at the end of the day. I don't know if you agree with that, Jillian. That's something you would probably look more closely at than anybody else, but um, is it a win-win for the president? Well, I don't think it is because, you know, a lot in the a lot of the Trump folks supporters have gone out of their way to point out that this this is not a referendum on the president. And maybe that is true. But it is certainly a test of his political clout and political prowess with his really ardent supporters. The Trump diehards, I think, are tested a bit in this race. How so? In the, in the sense that are we going to go with, if we accept the, the optics here, right, which is that President Trump is throwing his weight behind the maverick, not behind the maverick candidate, but behind the more establishment candidate that is supported by Mitch McConnell and the GOP leadership in the Senate. Are they going to go right now with the president or are they going to go with the more Trump like candidate, which everybody agrees Judge Moore is? And so I think, again, while it's not necessarily a referendum, it is a little bit of a, a, a predictor to some of the races maybe in 2018. I just like mine. Oh, that's a See long way off. Like my me. race. <laughs> Here's the thing, too. I've, I've worked on campaigns. I've worked for Republican primaries. I've seen this movie play out a billion times. Mm -hmm. Every primary, it's the anti-establishment candidate versus the, the establishment candidate. This is how it goes down. I mean, I can go back to 2012. I was working on a Republican primary. Sarah Palin endorsed our candidate, and we were, we were putting it out there as the fight in, uh, for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. So we've seen this yeah. movie play out. And so the idea that somehow President Trump has divided the party when we had 17 candidates in the Republican yeah. Primary. No, it was I just don't divided. accept the a lot of the narratives well, that are being pushed about this race. And you look at the original race. maverick, if you will, John McCain, and where he is. I mean, he's on the side of, of those four GOP senators right now that are blocking the, the path to what Republicans have talked about for seven years. Well, Senator McCain, I think, is on the side of the Democrats at this point, and everybody knows Ooh. it. And uh, he made a big mistake. But uh, listen, uh, at this point, we need to go back and uh, go to my site. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, we're moving on. <laughs> Lisa. Because <laughs> yeah. I will fight, and I will have enough energy well, to, go, to go to Washington and get things done. There will be more opportunities for the plot. Yeah, well, I will. But Hillary Clinton now slamming reports that senior White House official Jared Kushner used a private email account to discuss some official government matters. Clinton is also complaining about all the scrutiny she got over her own email scandal. Watch. It's just the height of hypocrisy. It mm -hmm. is something that... Um, if they were sincere about, I think you'd have Republican members of Congress calling for an investigation. So much of it was um, overblown, untrue, uh, really aimed to score political points, which it did. And uh, I take responsibility for it. You know, I say it was a dumb mistake, but it was a dumber scandal. Kushner's lawyer telling Politico that fewer than 100 emails were sent or returned to colleagues from Kushner's personal account and that all of them have been preserved, 
In Clinton's case, a private server was set up and her state.gov account was never activated. Meantime, the New York Times is reporting several other former and current Trump White House officials also use private email accounts. Now, House Oversight Committee Chairman Trey Gowdy and ranking Democrat Elijah Cummings are demanding answers in a letter to the White House. They write, with numerous public revelations of senior executive branch employees deliberately trying to circumvent these laws by using personal, private, or alias email addresses to conduct official government business, the committee has aimed to use its oversight and investigative resources to prevent and deter misuse of private forms of written communication. Um, Antonio, what's your take on this? Particularly, I want to get your your take on what Hillary Clinton said. You know, we know that she never set up a state.gov account. She used a private server, deleted tens of thousands of emails. Mm -hmm. Is is there a similarity here, or is there a difference? Did she use the actual word hypocrisy? Because she's the person that actually is next to hypocrite. hypocrite. I mean, there's a person there who. I mean, over her entire career has never really given back to the American people. And she's still complaining about the same thing. And uh, I suggest just keep talking because the more she talks, the worse it goes for the Democratic Party. Um, what happened, right, is the name of her book. We know what happened. She made some huge mistakes and she was not honest with the American people. We know who she is as a person right now. Benghazi, Iran, uh, you know, and all the deals that she's made over her entire career that are just been devastating to this country. So at this point, go ahead, keep talking because uh, you're not going to win much from the American people at this point. Julian, I want to get your take. Obviously, as someone who's worked for two different administrations, um, using some of these government accounts that we're talking about, what's your take on this? I think that First of all, to just respond to Antonio, I think that it's a mistake in this situation to put the focus on and I'm not saying you're doing this, but the way we're framing this discussion today is putting the onus on Hillary Clinton. The onus here is on Jared Kushner and the other senior five administration officials who are accused of using non-government email servers. We can debate, Hil I've sat on this couch a thousand hours and debated Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, pretty much the entire American public is united around the idea that that was wrong, that it was probably maybe illegal. But the question here is, this is a double-edged sword for the Trump administration because they don't have they don't have any claims to plausible deniability. Not that. Sec then Hold Secretary on. So Clinton that's a really did. important point to get but to about the legality of let this. It's finish. not illegal to have a private email working in the White House. The, no, the Sandra, but it is illegal when you break the when you have a security clearance. If you put classified Correct. information, different, different, different. And so, that was part of the Hillary. So Clinton let's get debate. to this. So Kushner's lawyer says he exchanged fewer than 100 emails from January through August, uh, either sent or returned by him to colleagues in the White House from his personal email account. Most were news articles or political commentary. All all have been preserved in any event. His lawyer's words. Different story yeah. than Hillary Clinton's use his, of a private you server. you want to take his lawyer's word at face That's all I have to go off of, Jillian. Jillian. Yes. Well, to the but, server. But, okay, let me just finish my point from earlier, and, which is that when Hillary Clinton was accused of all these things, she was the first major public figure to go through this issue in the she and then to leave that to then to destroy Let, can I finish my point my point is that she relied on the argument of plausible that. deniability that is some people bought it right that is off the table we've had a public debate about this now for a year the Trump administration cannot cite that so they're a little bit more vulnerable is the I point mean, that I was trying to make been preserved and not destroyed <sighs> I mean we know that she Deleted. Maybe she they deleted were about her yoga and, and her daughter's emails. wedding. Yeah. Whatever. She deleted thirty thousand pieces of, of documents. Well, but I'm not comparing the but, two. And Hillary Clinton was also the nation's top diplomat, so she was using, as James Comey said, a, a email account that was less secure than Gmail, traveling to a lot of foreign nations with, you know, who knows what information on her it server that could have easily have been a Uma Abedin, whose husband now has been found guilty and sentenced to prison for messing with an underage girl online. So. so yeah. I mean, we, we had a corruption of judgment going on around that particular presidential candidate. It's different. But, Julie. I, I, but Julie, Harris, I'm I never said this, I'm not making the comparison. You guys are. You guys made this story about Hillary Clinton. I think it's about the New York Times report about Jared wait, Kushner. Wait, wait, we didn't make it about Hillary Clinton. Clinton. Hillary Clinton no made it about Jared Kushner. No one else we, on the couch has addressed that. Julie, love you, girl, but we got, we got to move on. We so did not tie that later. New developments in the heated battle over immigration and the fate of so-called dreamers, an issue firing up protesters at a recent Nancy Pelosi event.
Now two GOP senator, senators offering a new bill that they hope can get conservatives on board. We'll break it down next. A new Washington Post ABC News survey finds 86% of Americans support protections for so called dreamers, younger illegals brought to the U.S. as children. And now Republican Senators Tom Tillis and James Lankford are unveiling a new dreamers bill that they hope can win the support of conservatives. The bill bars dreamers from applying for citizenship for at least 15 years, bars them from sponsoring family members unless they become a citizen, requires a college degree or military service and bars those who commit violent crimes. But some liberals are already pushing back on the legislation, including Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, who says, quote, this bill falls short. It excludes tens of thousands of dreamers who came to the United States as children, have lived here for decades, and have clean criminal records based solely on arbitrary date cutoffs. I'm sure, Antonio, you've put some thought into this. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're talking to a, an immigrant that came from Italy in, in 19, 1985 and became an American citizen in the, the mid-90s, and I did it the right way. My, my family had to work extremely hard, wait in line, and do all the procedures and uh, do everything legally. So at this point, we need to uh, reform this. Uh, immigration has to be reformed at some so point. So what about this bill specifically, Lisa? This bill specifically, I think, listen, if, if you did something illegal 20 years ago, is it not illegal now? Or is it illegal at this point? I mean, if you cross the border, whatever time it was, and it was against the law, then it, it's still against the law today. I think we need to look at the books. We need to. We have the greatest laws in the world here. Let's follow the law. Mm. Uh, but to to do something like this, and it's always goes back to, uh, you know, for me personally. I love this country, and my family works so hard. So for me, you have to wait in line. You have to do things legally, and then. Imagine your children, if you bring them here and, and you tell them, listen, you're not here uh, as an American. You're here because I brought you here. I mean, how, do, how would you feel as a family? So uh, when you look okay. at the details of this particular bill, Lisa, do you think this could win the heart of conservatives? Well, I think that's what is going to be the tough sell on this is conservatives who would like to see something like the RAISE Act or building the wall or E-Verify built into this. But I think what underscores sort of the difficulty that Congress is going to have in addressing that is the fact that you do have conservatives that are going to be pushing back on this bill by Senators Lankford and Tillis. And then you also have Democrat Senator Dick Durbin saying this goes too far, right? So how do you find that mm. sweet spot uh, where you have enough people uh, happy enough to get to that 60 vote? threshold in the Senate and enough votes in a majority in the right. House, right? So I think that's going to be, therein lies the difficulty with bipartisanship in Washington, D.C. Um, I almost sneezed. I was holding back a second. <laughs> because you were saying something yep. that I really hadn't heard interjected into the conversation as mm -hmm. much. And it's such a great point. There actually is no, it's not like other crimes, there actually on the books that I know of is no um, retroactivity or, or a moratorium on when it expires if you came to this country illegally. There's right. not some point no. where you suddenly become legal because that would be amnesty. Right. Statute exactly. of limitations. Mm -hmm. I think that's right? the word. Yeah. yeah. Let's say we allow everyone who's been here for, let's say, 20 years to be American at some point. At that point, do we actually build the wall and we say this is the law at this point? How do we do? How do you do it? How do you do it? You know, so laws, what do you do? I just want to point out that I think it's really. I probably Lisa would agree with me on this. Like, it's good that we're having the conversation right now about a proposed about a proposed piece of legislation, rather than if President Trump had renewed President Obama's executive order, we would now be arguing about whether or not it was part of his legal. Uh, presidential prerogative to do so, meaning we're focusing on the issue at hand, which right. is what kind of and that's something what very kind of positive. positive. I agree with that's you, right. Right. How yeah. the president like has I think, handled it. Yeah, so yeah. that's something good to and come. And that's of a this. bipartisan. Like, I don't know if Democrats would agree, but. Getting to the is, meat of the issue rather true. than circling around it. Yeah. All right. Attorney General Jeff Sessions speaking at Georgetown University today, and faculty members joining students protesting his speech. Are they proving Sessions' point that freedom of speech is under attack on America's campuses? Plus, professors at the University of North Texas also blasting the school's decision to invite Donald Trump Jr. to speak on campus. We will discuss. They have the right to their own opinion, but personally, I would like for them just to teach.